Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks to John for setting up um, my presentation quite nicely. I think actually I'm going to repeat a little bit of what John has put into his presentation, um, but hopefully I can kind of maybe highlight a little bit more of the science elements of it that um, have gone into the, the expert working group and also have gone into policy. Um, I just want to start by first acknowledging the fact that what I'm about to present really is the uh, work of multiple people from across AFPI, and you'll see their names at the top of the slides um, and, and just acknowledge their, the hard work that they've put into this uh, research. Um, I want to start to give a bit of an overview of um, nutrient management and the, the, the research that we're doing to provide evidence base for nutrient management, sustainable nutrient management in Northern Ireland, and give a little bit of context to that and look at some of the research that's delivered solutions. Um, and I think John has already shown how some of those some of that research has already delivered solutions. Um, also to consider then some of the new research we're doing and look at some of the new, challenge, new challenges that we're going to have to deal with uh, going forward. Now just to start with, I want to put up these, two, these uh, two graphs just to kind of highlight the complexity of the nutrient cycles we're talking about, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus. There is multiple pathways, multiple transformations from one pool to another, and multiple sources. And it, they're very, very complex systems. And you know, there's been you know, careers built on these systems. Um, and they're very, they're very challenging in terms of understanding what's happening on, uh, in these particular um, nutrient cycles. But when you, when you think about it, and for the purpose of this presentation, I just wanted to distill it down to three key issues. One issue is the sources of, the, of those nutrients in the landscape and on our farms. Also, how they're being transported, not just being transported into the environment, but how they've been transported into um, our cattle and how they've been transported into herbage. And then we also need to consider the impact. What is the impact of these, uh, these nutrients on the environment and also um, within um, agriculture? It's very important, um, and I think it, it's so far nobody's put up a, a definition of sustainable intensification. So I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd put this up here in that sustainable intensification is about balancing production against the environment. And the word sustainable covers the, soci the socio-economic, particularly the social science, the economic science, and the environmental science. And it's very important we get those three things together. Again, the complexity is of, of the nutrient cycle is made even more difficult in terms of the scales that we have to work at. And in our research, these are the sort of scales that we're looking at. We're looking at right down to the micro scale of, in soils, trying to understand what's happening there. We're also looking at, at farm scale, we're looking at catchment scale, right up to global scale. And in addition to that, we need to think about the temporal scales. You know, nutrients change within seconds within the soil. It can be years, days, and decades. And what we're trying to do, what we're ultimately trying to do, we're trying to take all that complexity through our research, and we're trying to distill it down to farm-specific nutrient management practices. That each farm is being, is, has nutrient management practices that are specific for their production and for their environmental requirements. So just to maybe focus in on a little bit of the, um, the, the research, and in, in, when we're talking about sources, we're talking about landscape, we're talking about animals, we're talking about um, uh, farmyards and so forth. And a big issue that John has already um, highlighted is the, the whole issue around ammonia. Um, and AFPI has been doing research on ammonia over the last number of years. Um, and one, one piece of research that we have looked at is ammonia loss from, from housing. Um, and this piece of research used alum as a way of, of reducing ammonia loss post um, following the scraping away of urea, uh, sorry, of urine and slurry. And you can see that alum reduces uh, ammonia emissions by, by 80 percent, or 70 to 80 percent um, over an extended period of time. But it's very important, and John has already mentioned these two figures, so I'm not going to dwell on them, but it's very important that we deal with ammonia, not just in a, in a housing perspective, but deal with it in, in, a, in a very much a holistic perspective. And we've done a good bit of research um, over as far back as, um, as 1994 when Peter Frost did some research on the low emission slurry spreading techniques. And John has already dealt with those, so I won't uh, go into them in detail. Another big issue that we've dealt with in the, in, in the recent past is uh, dietary phosphorus. How do we push down the, uh, the diet, uh, dietary pea um, of, of, our, of our cows without impacting on milk yields? And this was some work that looked at, at uh, milk yields over four different lact lactations. And considering it from, uh, from the perspective of four point um, 4.5 and 3.6 grams per kilogram phosphorus in the diet. And you can see that you can push the, the, the pea content of the diet down to 3.6 without having any significant impact on the, the milk yields over four different lactations, which is important. But we also looked at that from the perspective of pea loss and runoff. And, and in this particular graph, just to highlight that, 
the uh, 4.5 and 3.6 equates roughly to 1% and 0.9% uh, P in, the, in slurry. And in this case, when you reduce the P content of your slurry, it results in a reduction in P loss in, in runoff, which is very important in terms of balancing production and balancing the um, uh, environmental protection element. Legacy P is a big issue for us. It's a very, very big issue um, in terms of you know the, the graph here you can see on the, uh, the the map of Northern Ireland. You can see the pink and, and red areas. You know it's estimated above 50% of our soils are above the agronomic optimum for for soil P, which is uh, index two plus. So we've done some research and looking at well, if we stopped applying um, any manure or, or P to those soils, how long would it take us to achieve? Um, uh, achieve index two. If we're starting at index four, how long would it take us to achieve index two? And in the case of this soil, it took them 12 years, and that's with no phosphorus supplied to it. So it's quite a big challenge when you're thinking that we need to continue uh, applying slurry to many of these soils. In the case of um, emissions, gaseous emissions, it's very difficult. Once they leave the source, it's very difficult to manage them. Uh, in the case of ammonium, we might be able to ammonia. We might be able to put up shelter belts, but it, we're we're have a better opportunity in the, in, this, in the context of phosphorus and nitrogen that moves through the landscape and water, we have a better opportunity of, of maybe managing some of those transport pathways. Now, this is a graph that shows um, runoff risk in Northern Ireland. And this is just for one location and for 2011 and 2012. And the blue bar here shows that if you went out in February and you were looking for a one day in February that doesn't have any overland flow, has no risk of overland flow, there's only 10% of days in February that there's no risk of overland flow. If you're looking for two consecutive days, which we require for our slurry spreading, that goes below 10%. And that's in contrast to August, where you're going up to about 70% of days have no, um, have no risk of uh, overland flow. So that's a big challenge for, for us in Northern Ireland. Um, now, there is a criticism as you could say, well, that's just one location. Well, it is one location, but it's representative of 47% of soils across Northern Ireland. So a high percentage of our soils have a high risk of runoff on a, on a much of the year, particularly um, when you're talking January, February, October, November, December. So it's very important that we manage those pathways effectively. And John has already highlighted there in relation to identifying the overland flow pathways, which is work that we've been doing for the last, um, last number of years. Um, and it's basically what you're looking at there is that you're moving from the, the green to the yellow to the red. If rainfall, if rainfall uh, falls on the landscape, it will travel down those pathways into the uh, into lakes and rivers, and that's the Hillsborough Farm. I, w I want to highlight, John has, has rightly said, a lot of our phosphorus is going um, um, out of the uh, farms on overland flow, but we can't ignore drains. Drains are a really important um, uh, pathway for export, and phosphorus isn't our only problem. We have, you know, we have uh, pesticides, we have sediment, we have other contaminants that go out through our drains, so we need to be I'm looking at, well, how can we identify our drains, particularly those historical drains that are in, in the landscape for a long time. They may not be that um, active at this point, but they are still a pathway of nutrient loss and of contaminant loss. So we need to be able to update that map you see on the, on the screen there. We need to be able to update that risk map, including drains in that risk map. And that's a big challenge for research going forward. And this is um, work that's coming out of the EAA scheme. And if we can identify where those pathways are, and here those pathways are, the yellow and the, the, uh, the red areas, these are the areas that are highest risk for, for nutrient loss in the landscape. If we can identify where those areas are, we can manage them. And in this case, for example, you could say that during certain months of the year, a farmer may not want to spread slurry in those red and yellow areas. He, could, he would, uh, he would uh, distribute the slurry to other areas of the field and avoid those, uh, those high-risk areas. The other interesting point of that, that map is that you see those, those, those purple dots in the air, in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the map are the points of entry into lakes, sorry, into rivers and ditches. If we can identify those points of entry, we can disrupt them. We can stop them from, from entering into lakes and rivers. And if we can do that, then we can target mitigation measures and we can disrupt the pathways and we can stop the pathways from, from, uh, from occurring. This is a bit of work that we're doing in, in Hillsborough and it's preliminary data, but it's starting to show, this is where we have used willow and willow buffer strips, and uh, 10 meter willow buffer strips, and we've planted some fields with willow and some fields without willow buffer strips. And the fields that are planted with the willow buffer strips are having significantly less P exported from those fields, because we've disrupted the pathway in those cases. 
Now we're trying to scale this up, we're trying to move it up to, to field scale, and the, 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 the map you see there, we're trying to look at, well, can we pl plant willow in those shaded areas? Um, again, that map is showing those, the yellow and the green areas is showing the, 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 where overland flow is converging in the landscape. And can we plant willow in those areas and disrupt those pathways and stop nutrients from um, it being exported in, th in those areas? Agroforestry, there's been a lot of, um, a lot of work done uh, by Jim McAvan um, in terms of agroforestry over the past number of years, and it's been incorporated within the, the Export Working Group's reports. And agroforestry is a really good option in terms of increasing the carrying capacity of the soil, reducing the, the, the soil moisture content of the soil. And in this case, you can see in the, in the blue and the red um, bars, in the case of the, the blue bar where agroforestry has been planted, there's significantly higher carrying capacity in those soil types. P uh, resistance to penetration is an indicator of carrying capacity. Um, so there's a higher carrying capacity in those soils. And in, in it, the, the work that Jim has done has also shown that you increase the grazing season by up to 17 weeks if you, in those fields that have, uh, have agroforestry. So that's a very um, strong piece of research that in certain areas of the landscape, agroforestry may be a solution for some farmers. So it's also, we, we, you know, understanding the impacts is very important. And I know, uh, you know, a, a lot of our research has recently, uh, over the last number of years, has gone in on understanding the impacts on the environment and also understanding the impacts on, on production. Um, Again, going back to the, you know, the big issue around ammonia, um, back in 2004, there was research done on um, ammonia emissions, sorry, ammonia deposition within Northern Ireland. And in the SNFA report, they put in 12 uh, ammonia sensors across the, 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 the province. And they found that um, in 11 of the 12 um, probes, they were above the, the critical threshold for those, uh, for those particular habitats. So, which is a big, a big issue going forward. But what we're, what AFP is doing now is that through funding from the Department of Agriculture, we'll be putting in place 25 ammonia probes across um, Northern Ireland to see if that situation has changed um, over the last, since uh, 2004. Um, AFP has a, a, quite a strong track record in, in terms of catchment scale research, particularly in Loch Ney, Loch Erne, um, and also in the Colebrook and up the upper band catchments. Um, but in recent times, we have really kind of um, upped our investment in, these, um, in this sort of research. And this, um, this, this graph here shows the, um, the extent of the, 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 the catchments that we're involved in at the moment. Now, to a greater and lesser extent, we're not fully involved in, 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 in detailed research in all these catchments, but we are spreading um, the, 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 the amount of work we're doing. And this is very important work because catchments vary in their ability to cope with agricultural intens intensity. Now this graph here is, um, just to explain the, the, the y-axis here, the y-axis is fisheries ecosystem class. That's a measure of water quality, of good water quality and bad water quality. A, a fisheries ecosystem class of one is very, very good. A fisheries ecosystem class of six or seven is not, um, is not very good. And, what's, and each of these blue dots is a catchment. And this is a relatively, this is you know, low intensity catchments of, you know, uh, in terms of stocking density. You're only going from about one to 1.5 um, livestock units per hectare. But what this graph, if you look at um, one livestock unit per hectare, you can see that in some catchments, you're at a fisheries ecosystem class of one, which is very good. But in other catchments, you have a fisheries ecosystem class of six. So why, why is that difference? These catchments are actually quite close, and they're all agri agriculturally dominated catchments. Why are some catchments able to cope with a higher stocking rate than others? And we need to get our, hand, our, our, our understanding on, around that in terms of the variability in the landscape and how we can make turn that variability into an advantage for us in, in Northern Ireland in terms of managing um, agricultural intensification. This is a, um, a, one of the catchments that we've been doing research in since back in 1990. It's the upper bound catchment, which John referred to, and we've been, we're doing the derogation study in here, derogation monitoring study, and we're also doing the, the EAA scheme in this uh, area, where we're doing a very, very high intensity monitoring of um, nutrient export um, in runoff, we're also doing high intensity monitoring of soils, um, and also we have LIDAR data for the whole of this, um, for this catchment. What this, this, these sort of platforms are very important for AFPI in terms of research, because it allows us to, to link farm scale processes, to farm and field scale processes right up to catchment scale processes. And to, to do that sort of research, you need long data sets. You need to be investing in these sort of research, this sort of research over 10, 15 time span, um, years time span to get the sort of results that we need to go back to um, funders and go back to policymakers to show that these measures are having an impact. 
Um, so just to go down a scale now, go down to field scale, we, we spoke about there briefly about slurry and the challenges there for slurry um, spreading in Northern Ireland, but there's also huge benefits in terms of soil health. Um, and this is work that, that in the long term, a slurry site in Hillsborough showing that um, even at high rates of slurry application, um, uh, there is still carbon being sequestered in the soil. Now this is important because the IPCC report would say that the um, slurry becomes saturated in the soil after 20 years. This research is saying that's not the case. In Northern Irish soils, we can sequester carbon over a much more extended period of time, which is important for our, um, our carbon footprint of our farms. Liming is another big issue that we've been, uh, and something we've been doing research on uh, quite extensively. Um, and again, this slide shows that there's, there's multiple benefits from liming um, in, uh, in, in Northern Ireland. Um, it helps, it, it, there's a positive effect on carbon sequestration, there's a positive effect on nutrient cycling, there's a positive effect on yield. So it's a, it's a win-win situation. Now there is some further research that needs to be done in terms of nutrient retention, um, but overall we find that there's a positive impact on, on uh, multiple ecosystem services, and that's very important. So there's new challenges now. I'm sure if we went, to that, went around the room, everybody here would have different opinions on what are the new challenges in terms of sustainable intensification. I've just picked out three. Um, and the first one was something that John touched on, but is a really, really important point. How do we, behavioral change and adapting, cha uh, adapting change is really important. Now most of our research and most of uh, AFPI's research and I think within Northern Ireland has focused on the issues around natural and financial capital. You know, what's, what are the financial issues and what are the natural issues that are controlling, um, controlling farmers' ability and the industry's ability to adapt to change so that they can, they can intensify sustainably. We need to start investing in research on the human elements, the skills, the education, and also the social elements. They're really important. And it's something that we're starting to address within uh, AFPI through a project called Refocus Project, which is doing a fossils vulnerability assessment of the whole of the UK with Northern Ireland as well as case studies. And we want to look at, well, how would farmers adapt to uh, fossil shortages or phosphorus um, the in increase in fertilizer costs um, in, in the industry. So we're starting to look at it, those kind of more human and uh, social elements through with collaboration with some of our uh, universities in the UK. Precision, big data, everybody's talked about big data um, today and you know, it's increasingly important. We have looked at it in the past, you know, I suppose it's very important in terms of nutrient management. Um, we're seeing very variability in yields across fields and across um, farms. If we can provide farmers with big data in a format that they can use, then we can hopefully eradicate some of these variation in yields. It's a project, one of the projects that AFPI and in, in conjunction with stakeholders, one of the projects that we're investing in at the moment is the work that's been done now in Hillsborough in developing this dairy farm platform and looking at how you can use all these um, high tech um, data collection to inform management on a day to day basis in the, um, in the farm. And finally, uh, manure processing. This is a huge issue, and this goes back to um, this goes back to that issue around legacy soil pea. Um, not everywhere. We're not going to be able to export um, or redistribute slurry everywhere in Northern Ireland. It has to be redistributed in the right places at the right time. In, but we have to be able to process the manure to make it uh, economic and cost effective to do that. So again, AFPI has invested um, with the Department of Agriculture in the Nutrient Management Centre out in Hillsborough, and hopefully there'll be a lot of research done on that in the near future. Um, there's a lot of new research, a lot of these issues I've dealt with, we've been very successful in re recent times in, in securing a lot of um, funding from, from Europe, from, um, from the UK, from Ireland, um, and, and from the Department of Agriculture in looking at sustainable nutrient management practices. Um, so these are just some of the projects I've put up here, I'm sure I've missed, uh, I've missed a whole load of others, but it's just to give you a flavour of the sort of projects that we are undertaking in, in the next uh, few years. So just to say that the, I suppose I've uh, have covered a lot of topics there, and uh, if there is particular questions that you're interested in, I can't answer them today, then just let me know, email me, and I'll be able to pass on your query to the particular scientist that's involved in, in that piece of research. Thank you for listening. <laughs>